Hello everyone, Forest Focus, as we turn our attention today to Nottingham Forest women who've started their season in incredible fashion. I'm joined by Reds winger Cara Hamilton to discuss the season so far and the promotion push, which is plus her own career, which has taken in Ireland, Iceland, now Nottingham, and a lot more in a very interesting life. You've just been training in good Nottingham weather, Cara. How are you doing? Yeah, not too bad considering the, the weather conditions today. It feels like we've just rocked up in the middle of November today. <laughs> Well, all preparing for a game on Sunday, which which we'll discuss uh, in some depth later. Uh, we'll get on to your life and career as well. It's your first season in Nottingham. How, how is it going? What made you join as well? Because you stepped down a level with a few of the other players. What attracted you to the club? There's a multitude of things. Um, first of all, I think Carly herself um, was a, a massive draw. Um, I know her qualities as a, a coach. Um, and as, as soon as I spoke to her, really, she kind of, give me an insight into the vision of the club, where it's at right now, where it's come from and the direction that they want to go in. Um, and I think, you know, although it's a, a step down as such as you might look at it, um, dropping down a league from last year, I think the level um, that the club's operating at certainly doesn't um, say tier three. Do you know, I think they're working at a level that's far beyond a lot of championship clubs and maybe even WSL as well. So the backing that the club has has given the women's team was a huge draw. Um, the caliber of players that they've brought in this year as well um, means that it's a really challenging environment and being challenged every day and pushed to be my best. Um, so I think I got that all from the conversation with her. And then as soon as I came here and visited it, um, I knew it was the right fit. Um, you might not even have been here for many times. It sounds like you've, you missed four years of your career with a foot injury. You uh, yeah. you were going to do CrossFit, all that kind of stuff. We'll get into that. I mean, how did you get into football then? Was it always going to be your path as a kid or were you perhaps looking elsewhere when you first got into it? I think I just was extremely active as a kid um, loved playing sport um, and was just extremely competitive. So whatever sport was going, I was I was happy to play and, and compete at. Um, so like I, I honestly did everything like swam as a kid competitively and um, did athletics. And um, I think football was probably the one that I got the most success at at an early age. And I think that's probably why I took that path initially. I mean, you were almost sort of uh, kind of defined in a way as a, as a 15 year old because you're playing football for Northern Ireland already at that age. I think you were only just 15 as well. That's pretty mental. How do you reflect on it now, like uh, about 12 years later, I think? I think it's only now that I sort of realise how big a deal that was at the time. I just sort of took everything in my stride. I think I was a bit of a an old head on young shoulders is how I've been described by other people. So I think I had a level of maturity, probably a bit beyond my age. Um, and when I look at, you know, 15 year olds now, I, I don't think that anything like that would kind of happen. I think it probably just is where the game was at at that point. Look, at, there wasn't as many people there wasn't as many females playing the game. Um, it certainly wasn't as competitive. So I think as a 15-year-old, I could come in and get by. Um, but I think the way the game has progressed now, um, I don't think that would stand. But um, like I said, that's probably why I took the, the football route because um, at 15, I ended up rep representing my country at senior level. Um, and I just sort of thought that from there, things would just sort of take off. And I thought, OK, I'm going to step into a professional career post um, education and everything like that. But as we'll probably come on to, um, things started to get a little bit complicated with injuries and stuff. Yeah, I mean, tell us about when the injury started and I was reading about it. It sounded like it was going to be just a minor one that footballers get quite often and it just spiraled into like just a bit of a, a total nightmare for you, I guess. Yeah, so it was a stress fracture that I picked up whilst um, representing Northern Ireland at the time. And, um, you know, typically stress fractures do heal within sort of eight to 12 weeks um, just by offloading. And I think... The reason that it occurred was just the amount of um, sport that I was trying to balance at that point, like trying to represent Northern Ireland at three different age groups, 17, 19 and senior, playing club football, other sports. And um, so I just had to completely offload myself and stop playing. Um, but it was just a really complicated type of stress fracture. They were hesitant to operate on it initially, just I think because of my age. Um, so with about a year of trying to get the bone to heal naturally and um, they then decided okay we're going to operate 
then there was complications with the rehab and then they had to reoperate then at probably another year down the line um so once i got through all of those rehabilitation periods it it ended up being almost four years out of the game out of sport completely what stopped you dropping out completely and just giving up on football and because loads of people would have dropped out of the game at that point especially at that age what kept you going it crossed my mind a number of times i just thought this isn't meant to be for me there's another path for me to take um and yeah, I just thought, is this worth it really? Because there wasn't an awful lot of support back then as well from a medical standpoint. Um, that's another huge development within the game is how players are now supported and looked after. Um, and from a financial standpoint, like my you know, my family had to take an awful lot of the burden um in terms of paying for surgeries and physiotherapy and all that kind of thing. Um so I don't know that I can say exactly what was going through my mind at that point, but I just, I didn't want to give up. Um, I just thought like, this isn't going to beat me. Um, an injury like this, like surely there is a way for me to be, to, to come back playing or to even to take up a different sport. I don't know. Um, but I didn't want to, I just couldn't see my life without any sort of sport or activity. Um, I, I just refused to kind of let that um, beat me, I guess. So you finally come back after four years and then you have a stint playing in your homeland and then you end up in Iceland. How does that happen and what was that like? Um, very strange the way it came about. I, I honestly just got a, a phone call one day. So I was um, still in the middle of university study. Um, I'd previously had hopes of either coming to England or going to America because probably at that point that was the, the best place for females to play football at a high level. Um, but that all had to be scrapped with the injury at the time. Um, so I was yeah, back in my homeland in Northern Ireland, as you said, um, and literally just picked up the phone one day and uh, a club in Iceland general manager had somehow come across me um, and they said, do you want to come and play for the season? So it was a summer season. Uh, so I was coming to the end of a semester of university and um, literally went within a couple of days. Um, she said, you have to give us an answer by Sunday. I think it was a Friday. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to gonna take this opportunity because I felt like I'd missed out on something like that, having been out for four years with the injury. And I just thought I need to take this opportunity um, now or I might not get it again. What was it like? Um, it was an incredible experience, honestly. Iceland is such a unique place. Um, the the culture and everything was was just so different to anything that, that I'd experienced before. Um, now they speak really good English, which was helpful because um, <laughs> there, there wasn't much hope of me picking up Icelandic um, in a short <laughs> period of time. Um, there was a couple other foreign players within the team that I was in. Um, so there was a, a couple of Americans and Canadians, which kind of helped me settle a little bit better as well. Um, but just the, the country, everything that you could sort of do, you know, on your off days, you were going to maybe see a waterfall or um go to a volcano or something like that just an incredible place um and somewhere that's still really really special to me and then i'm just going through your bio chronologically here sorry i'm sure you've been asked about all this stuff before but it's pretty it's pretty uh off the wall some of it you were going to quit football for a year to do crossfit before covid struck is that right Correct. Yeah. So it was something that I kind of picked up um whilst I was at university um when I Kind of was trying to come back to to playing playing football and um as part of my rehabilitation i was working with a strength and conditioning coach who coached out of a, a crossfit gym so that's kind of where i got the exposure to it initially i'd never seen or heard anything about it um and he he was the one that said oh i, I think you might enjoy this i think you might be quite good at it and like i said before from a young age had just done an awful lot of sports it was quite a good all-rounder um, and I think that's probably why I, I picked everything up really quickly kind of like the gymnastics side of it the higher skill elements I had a bit of a background in all of that and then was just you know naturally quite fit um, through football as well and um, so I kind of I think if you speak to anyone who kind of picks up CrossFit and gets into it it's kind of a like you're all in type thing um, and it is very addictive because you just want to get better at it there's so many different facets to it and um, that you want to try and develop and naturally being a competitor 
I was then just drawn in by that and the competitive side of it. And um, I started doing quite well in a couple of like local competitions that I did um, and then started expanding and going maybe further afield and traveling and, and also doing quite well in those. And I think then at that point, there was a, a couple of different things at play. You know, I think I'd football had become a little bit stagnant for me. I was back in Northern Ireland again, um, didn't really want to travel again because I'd met um Michael who's now my now my husband um so we got engaged got married so again it wasn't really a time where I could travel and explore potential transfers for football um and yeah I just wanted to try and pursue CrossFit and see how far I could go in it really um and then as you say COVID and lockdown hit so there was no competitions everything was cancelled um and yeah I was just back home in, in Northern Ireland again were you still sticking with football because you had the, I don't know if the timeline's right, the Euros were on the horizon, Northern Ireland were in it and it was a massive achievement to, to get there and then you suffer more um, heartbreak, I guess, because you, you missed the tournament with injury, is that right? I did, yeah, and also prior to that, um, I ruptured my ACL in 2020. Mm. Uh, so that, at that time, I'd gone back to Glen Torren, which was my home club. Um, this is just coming out the back end of sort of the real um, heavy lockdown period um, and they'd run like a, a reduced uh, league within Northern Ireland and at the end of that season then I ruptured my ACL in, in late 2020 and had the surgery so my comeback then was um, mid to late 2021 so that's when the the Euros campaign um, was kind of finishing and, and we'd find out that we'd qualified so I missed the back end of the, the Euro qualifiers but then my focus post ACL was to get myself into contention for the squad to go to the Euros in 2022 and all was kind of on course um so came back August 2021 from the ACL and then the following April or May time um just as the squad was um about to be picked and um, picked up a really complex uh quad injury um and then that kept me out for uh the remainder of the summer uh so missed missed the euros do you did the your previous experience with injury help you in the sense of dealing with it mentally because you've had a lot of stuff thrown at you in a short space of time here yeah i think it it did and it didn't i mean i, I sort of just thought like really why now why this again um surely i've kind of had my injury woes and I, I thought i was past it um but you know, I think I think you learn to just not play the victim. It's part of the game. Yes, the timing is terrible, but no time is a good time to be injured as a footballer. But um, it just yeah, it maybe felt that little bit more devastating the fact that we'd qualified for our first ever major tournament. And I mean, it's probably going to be very difficult for us to get back there again. So to miss that experience, um, yeah, it it hurt a lot. Um, but. <laughs> I mean, I enjoyed the experience that I had as a, a pundit for BBC. That was something that I never would have experienced um, had that not happened. Uh, so that was something really positive to come out of that. Just last year on yourself before we talk about Forest then. I mean, how much do all these, these experiences shape you, the good and the bad of it? It must make you a totally different person to what you, you might have been if you go back to being 14-year-old, Cara, just before you played for Northern Ireland. I don't know if you ever thought about the, the fork in the road and how things have panned out after that. Yeah, definitely not. You know, at, at 15 years old, um, coming into the senior team, I wasn't thinking about, you know, this could possibly end. You know, I thought I had the world at my feet. Um, I was the, you know, up and coming, you know, best young player coming out of Northern Ireland. And I sort of thought I was going to, you know, just keep going and keep climbing. And, you know, very quickly you learn that it's not a linear progression it's not an easy journey that it's ups and downs constantly yes some people have more than others um and there's no you know reason why it's you as opposed to someone else but you just gotta learn to deal with it and I think you you know you as you say you learn a lot about yourself and um, you learn about your own values and um, building resilience and also just realizing that football isn't the be all and end all that there's so much outside of that your career is very very short and yes you want to give it your all whilst you're in it um but also not allowing that to become your sole focus and allowing that to become your identity that your identity is so much greater than that um and I mean I'm so grateful also with 
the way that my life has panned out outside of football because I spent those times out injured. It meant that I, you know, met Michael, who is now my husband, and we can do this journey together now. Um, as opposed to, you know, a lot of people have to put stuff like that on hold, um, like family life and everything, just to to focus on their career. So, I mean, in a sense, I'm really grateful that I've been allowed to build a life outside of football as well. Uh, how do you find how do you find Nottingham? How does he find Nottingham as well? You always forget with these transfers, men's team, <laughs> women's team. There's normally someone that comes along for the ride: girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, kids, etc. How, how are they? How are you and he finding Nottingham? We've settled really well. Um, it was quite a smooth transition. Um, you know, we loved where we were last year at Lewis. Uh, it's a great place to, to live, and um, we had built really strong relationships down there. But um, you know, honestly, like the the club has been extremely welcoming and friendly, and we already feel like such a part of the club here. Just before we talk about uh, Forest and the games uh, in general, then a quick word for the Trent Navigation. Next event is uh, Comedy Night, uh, September the 19th. Get your tickets from gigantic.com. They're only £15. Brennan Reese, Jack Skipper and Luke Conran on the bill. I'm told they're very good comedians, Cara. So uh, hopefully lots of people will go down and support them. And thanks for their support for us at the NAV. Right. The season so far, I mean, I watched all, all, all the men's games. And they create loads of chances you can't score many goals at the moment. It's a bit different for you guys. Have you scored 22 goals in your first games or something? It's a pretty mental start to the season. How have you found it? Yeah, I mean, it's been, from a results point of view, you know, absolutely perfect. Um, but we are always, you know, looking for better, striving for better. Um, the coaches constantly demand the standards of us, higher standards and, and us of ourselves as well. And, you know, yes, we've scored a lot of goals, but we've created a lot more chances that we haven't converted as well. So we're really looking to try and push that conversion rate as much as we can um, limit, you know, chances against limit goals against everything like that. Look, like we will strive to get as close to, to perfect as we can in every game. Um, because we're we're not only looking at the here and now, but we're also looking to to build to the future as well. Yeah, I mean, just yeah. for the context of people watching who don't follow the women's team so closely, you, you're in the third tier, pushing for the second tier, um, and you've won every game, including a 6-1 win at Wolves, and those are always close matches normally. So you're obviously going well. Is there a, I guess there is a pressure and an expectation for promotion this season. How does that factor into the team kind of mentally? Is that a, a challenge in itself to deal with that? It depends on what way you look at it. I mean, for me, I look at it as an incredible opportunity. You know, to um, I feel as though I have been brought into the club and trusted, and it's as though they're saying to me, "Look, we believe in you. We believe that you're part of the the puzzle, part of the reason um, why we feel we can be promoted to the championship." Um, so I think opportunity is probably the word. You know. Um, to be part of the first team um, at Nottingham Forest to step into the championship. Um, that That's an incredible opportunity that, it, that I feel and I don't want it to, to burden me. Um, and I think it's just a really exciting time to be to be part of the club. I suppose when you go to training as well every, every day at the moment, um, you look around and see players around you. Like um, I suppose I don't like Kate Longhurst. I was watching the highlights of the women of the game against Wolves, like Mel Johnson scoring ridiculous goals as well. Does that drive you on internally for competition, just to keep your place and to keep showing what you can do as a group? One hundred percent. You know that's exactly what um, Carly wanted to create was a, a competitive environment uh, every single day, and you know that you can't you know, drop your standards for a second because there's somebody right there who wants your shirt. Um, and there's so many talented players in the building now who want minutes, who have played in the championship, who have played in the WSL. Um, but that doesn't give you any, you know, given right to just walk in and um, walk into the starting 11. And everybody knows that. And we're all on a level knowing that we're we're pushing each other to try and get the best out of each other so that we as a team achieve what we want to achieve this season. Um, you've got a game on Sunday against Stourbridge and it, it's at the city ground. Is this your, have you played, you've played the city ground before, haven't you? Have you played one? Yeah, game? That, the first um, home game against Calcio, yeah. What what was that like? Uh, I know I uh, don't know how big the crowd was, but to play on the pitch and you will get good crowds through the season as well. I'm sure. How was that for you stepping out for the first time? 
yeah, it's such a privilege to play uh, at a stadium like the City Ground, you know, for them to, for the club to say to us that, you know, we want you to be on the same level as the men's team. You know, you deserve that platform. Um, and yeah, really, really grateful to, to be able to call that our, our home pitch. And it, um, I think I was really taken aback actually when Mullocantar was played and um, the fans all standing up holding their scarves up over their heads and the you know the noise was great um so yeah I think we want to just continue to build on that fan base through the season keep putting on good performances for them scoring plenty of goals and giving them reasons to come back I suppose one thing about playing at the city ground is it's great for you it's also great for the opposition no disrespect to Stourbridge but I guess they're not going to play at a stadium like this too often so they're probably going to come and, and raise their game and probably present a different challenge to you in that sense as well at the weekend. Absolutely. And I think we've spoken about that internally as well, that every team will probably look um, to our game as kind of their cup final, I guess, if you're playing at the city ground, you know, that does feel like a huge occasion for them. Um, and so we have to be prepared for, for teams to, to come and, you know, put bodies on the line. I mean, respect to Sporting Calsa. I know that we, you know, we scored seven on the day, but they fought for absolutely everything, you know, putting in blocks and tackles and every team is going to want to do that. And, um, you know, there's a sense of pride in, in every single team. And especially when you come to big stadiums, you know, and you have the, you've got, you're playing against, you know, a big crowd who's for us you know you you, you want to put on a, a good performance and, and play for the shirt and you definitely see that level of commitment um from these teams so it's it's no game is an easy game because these teams are gonna absolutely fight to the death um just lastly tell us when it is but correct me if i'm wrong sunday two o'clock um tickets are six pounds through the forest website but um yeah that's right isn't it sunday at two sunday at two yep Everyone go and watch. I'm probably going to go. I think I'll go down myself and take the kids. Um, yeah, uh, I'm going to say if the weather's good. That's a proper fair weather fan, isn't it? That's a terrible attitude <laughs> to have. But yeah, yeah. Right. Um, thank you very much for joining us. You've had a really interesting life. That was a really interesting chat. So, yeah, thank you. Hope you enjoyed that, Cara. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Oh. Or Cara. I'll say to people before, I said, you know, do you prefer Cara or Cara? And she very generously said, whichever you prefer, which is nice. But uh, yeah, very, very interesting. And we'll catch up with more Forest women, uh, probably, uh, probably certainly in the next international break, but as often as we can through the season. So if people have enjoyed that, do us a favour, hit like, hit subscribe. You can become a channel member. Give us a lovely review uh, on iTunes. And thanks to everyone who came to the live show as well last night, of course. Right, we'll be back on uh, Monday. But in the meantime, if we don't see you then, we hope to see you soon.